Hello, good evening, everybody. Um, my name is Evelyn Diagostino, and today I have the honor to present Julio Pabon. Julio Pabon wears so many hats that I don't even know where to start. So Julio is a DJ. He is a percussionist since 1998. He is a teaching instructor on the Eastman School of Music, founder of Unidos Unidos, uh, Falsero. He's part of the crew of Rochester, um, what is called Essence of Rhythm. Uh, you're also- uh, Not anymore. I'm not part of that group anymore. Sorry. I should have told okay. you that. <laughs> no, I, I mean, I was just searching everything that you do. I mean, you are all over the place. You do mm -hmm. also, uh, you have to be a good dancer if you are been doing also Kisomba, which is extremely exhausting. I just get <laughs> <laughs> so tired just to look at that. Um, capoeirista, I don't even want to go there. But you need to be in so good shape to be that. Um, and I think one of the uh, most exciting is also your teacher. You teach from elementary to high school. Uh, mm -hmm. Julio, how many instruments do you play? Um, well, percussion is funny. Percussion is a huge family of instruments. I try to, well, when I first started with this music, it was more of a desire, not so much of something that I was part participating in actively. And that was when I was really, really young. I, my interest in music started when I was about eight or nine years old. And at that age, I really wanted to learn how to play, but I never had the opportunity. Then, like you said, in 1998, I was around, what, 12 or 13. That's when I really started to dive into it. And at Jefferson Middle School, actually, when it was a middle school, now it's not a middle school anymore. Now it's just a bunch of different schools in one. But we'll see. Maybe they'll change that in the fall. Um, but I started formally learning. And then from there, I decided that I wanted to keep on playing. And how many years has it been? Like 22 years now? Yes. But in regards to how many percussion instruments, I started on the classical uh, trend, basically snare drum, timpani, marimba, anything in the classical realm, realm. Then as my studies advanced, I became more involved in the Brazilian and then in jazz with vibraphone. Brazilian has a lot of different instruments. Latin music has a lot of instruments. So if I were to say a number of instruments, uh, probably around individually, around 25, 30 different percussion instruments. And then on top of that, I didn't put in my bio. In high school, I actually played the trombone and euphonium. So I ended up oh playing that God. too. And then in college, they yeah, in college, they teach you how to play piano, so I know how to play a little bit of piano. I'm not the best, but I, I can play a few chords here and there. Oh, wow. So you have that in your blood. Um, for those that are watching this uh, on Facebook, Julio's information is going to be on the description. And if you're going to look, if you're going to follow us in our YouTube channel, uh, all Julio's contact information is going to be also there. I have the experience to collaborate this year with Julio during the pandemic. Uh, he has to be, he has been an amazing mentor. Um, just navigating to the online, it's not easy. It's scary and it's intimidating, especially when you're teaching small kids. So Julio is also teaching at Eastman School of Music. So you definitely, if you're interested in learning percussion, I definitely recommend Julio. Um, I have met many, many artists, but Julio has been able to teach me and I can be able to get it. <laughs> I'm a horrible <laughs> learner. And my song, which have like a thousand ends in the pen. So he definitely love and he remembers the beat. So you use a lot of creativity when you're teaching to your students. Did you learn this from your teachers or how you came up with all these ideas? And we're going to show a little clip, a uh, little video later. So you have an idea what I'm talking about. But where did you get this ideas on teaching? Well, well, so um, my originally st started with in youth development. I worked for the Hillside Work Scholarship um, Program, which is part of the Hillside Family, Family Agencies. And within that, I learned a lot of different skills in regards to reaching out to, to students. When I first started, I was very bad at it. I was like, I didn't know how to talk to kids. But then after a while, I became more comfortable with how to you know, meet kids at their level and where they're at in life and really using those skills in regards to my um, professional 
um, engagement, which happens to be, I'm a per diem teacher for the city school district. So I, I work as, you know, as needed in, in the school, but at the same time, it's taking those skills and trying to develop immediately, immediate relations with students that you've only known for like 30 minutes, it's being able to connect with them immediately, which is a very hard skill. Most subs that I've met don't, don't really know how to do that. And so it's <laughs> really been a skill that I've been developing over the years. And then I use those same exact skills while I'm teaching music is kind of creating that connection immediately and finding really the, the hardest and easiest part for teaching percussion is being able to transfer the information to the student in the way they understand. Most yeah. teachers try to do the way they know it and it's the only way they know it. And when it comes to actually educating somebody on a specific topic or subject, if you're only teaching it one way, you're probably gonna have students that don't understand what you're saying, or the concept at all. And when I teach, my goal is to make sure that everybody understands. So if I see faces, it's like completely lost or blank faces. It's like, okay, we're going to try it a different way. Did that work? Yeah. No? Okay, we're going to try it this way. Did that work for the student? Because at the end of the day, if we're going to work in an ensemble, we all need to be on the same page. Because if anybody's not on the same page, then there's going to be issues down the road. It is. It is definitely is. Um, I have... I mean, we were doing some of the classes on Zoom and I'm like, wow, that's going to be difficult, but you manage so well to be able to keep us on track, keep us learning. Um, Project Carnival is coming on September, finger crossed, 2021. This project is being founded by the Community Foundation in Rochester. And one of the goals of the Project Carnival is to create cultural sensitivity, to learn from each other, to experiment different cultures. Now, this is Julio teaching us Brazilian batucada. Julio, you're from Puerto, Puerto Rico. <laughs> so tell us about <laughs> crossing different cultures, how, how you manage, because it's not easy. And we tend too much to be so close. Even I, I, I play guilty when I first was talking to one of our founders. He is Brazilian. And I said, well, we need a Brazilian teacher to be teaching. He said, no, 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 I, I have somebody. And he's, he's from Puerto Rico. I'm like, but he teach batucada? He said, yeah, yeah, you're going to. And I, I was a little like, wow. And you have opened our eyes so much. Like, oh my God, he's been amazing. And I'm so thankful that you're collaborating with us in this project. And we're so thankful for the sponsors and people that are making this possible. Um, because every time that since we've been in quarantine, one of the main topic is, oh, we need to listen to each another. We need to learn from each another. So tell me about your experience because you play music. How's that been working out for you? Um, well, I'll touch first on the, how I got into playing Brazilian music. <laughs> Um, well, this is actually, it actually started at the very beginning. There was this movie called Only the Strong. And Only the Strong is a very, it's a capoeira movie. And it, it's a very cheesy, but back then, it was like, oh my God, it, always, it was the first time in, in America where capoeira was introduced in a way where it was open to the masses. That was the very first time. And I saw that movie and I was like, oh man, that's really cool. I wanted that. <laughs> And what ended up happening while I was at Jefferson, Jefferson Middle School, um, there, uh, ironically enough, there was a guy named uh, Stephen Collins, we used to call him Nana, and he was one of the first capoeira teachers from New York, and this was back in the, in the late 90s. And we, he started offering free classes at um, Jefferson Middle School, and I got involved with that, and that's when, where I initially started capoeira. Long story short, that part of my life kind Kind of, I started Capoeira at that age, but then I stopped for almost, what, 10, 12 years I stopped. And then re within the past 10, eight, what has it been almost 10 years now that I, I was reintroduced into it and started playing Capoeira again. But what happened was the music that's involved in Capoeira really mm -hmm kind of inspired me too and then it kind of stuck in my head for all those years until I got to uh, in Miami after I graduated from Monroe Community College 
I went to University of Miami, and then, funny enough, my professor, he was Brazilian. His name was Ney Rosaro. He's, one of, he's a world-renowned percussionist. No one around the world, he's, uh, one of his pieces, which is called uh, Concerto for Marimba, is the most played uh, concerto by percussionists in the world. So he's, he's wow. really, really well known. But he, he really got us involved in learning Brazilian percussion. And he got us kind of like, gave us like the, the ABCs of learning how to play percussion. I think that's actually what the, the book's called, ABCs in Brazilian Percussion. And he really got us understanding different styles like samba, bayon, maracatu, forro, samba, reggae, really diving into those subjects, even at a surface mm -hmm. level. And then from there, I, I, it really like opened my eyes to all these other musical possibilities within within the world, really, because, you know, when I was growing up, all we yeah. listened to was salsa, merengue, a little bit of bachata here and there, because bachata back then was the most popular like it is now. But it was, you know, that was our musical background, yeah. which was great, but it was it was kind of restrained to that, that part of the world, which was the Caribbean, like Dominican Republic, Cuba, and Puerto Rico. And then when I started learning more about Brazilian uh, percussion, it really opened my eyes like, wow, there's a lot of different countries and they play a lot of different styles of music. Yeah, but I really fell in love with Brazilian percussion in particular. And then I started playing with the group called, well, actually two groups. I started playing with a group called Manhattan, Manhattan Samba when I was living in New York City after I graduated. Uh, I played with Manhattan Samba and then another group called Samba New York. And those two really helped develop me as a percussionist within the Brazilian percussion, uh, Brazilian world. And then helped solidify a lot of my own ideas about br Brazilian percussion and kind of let me venture out and use some of the, 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 the foundation that I learned from them. And then explore different teachers throughout the world and kind of develop my own ideas of how I wanted my groups to sound here in Rochester. That's good. Um, so your students, what nationality are there? Do you have a mix or what what they look like? Uh, most of my students are American, believe it or not. Um, I have yet to, well, my goal would be eventually is to have another group, a separate group that would be mostly city students or city in, um, city um, kids that participate that live in this that basically work in the city school district or are studying in the city school district. Um, I think that percussion has a transformative effect on people can really or music in general can really um, really impact their in a positive way like it did mine. I, the reason I say I want to work um, specifically with city school kids is because I, I grew up in the city schools. I went at Jefferson Middle School. I, I went to high school at East High School under Priscilla Brown. And then my teacher, my um, private teacher for percussion, first was his name is Mike, Mike Turo. And he was, he was a, an Eastman um, student at the time. And then I studied with him for a year. And then I moved over to Ruth Khan, which is another world renowned percussionist. She, she's known all around the world. And those two, as my mentors, specifically um, Priscilla Brown and Ruth Khan, have really, really influenced my life in becoming a percussionist and, be, and dedicating my life to becoming uh, being a percussionist for the rest of my life. Even if it's not uh -huh. like my main career, it's still a huge part of my life. And really helped me think about how music, specifically percussion in my case, really helped change the course of my life. And I, my, one of my goals would be to be able to do the same, but for more than just one student. It's like taking a group of kids and not t necessarily having them do what I did, like becoming a percussionist, going to school and studying music. Like, no, not, that's not, not everybody's gonna do that. But even during their time in the city schools, being able to benefit from percussion and music mm -hmm. and kind of help give them a, one, a sense of discipline, two, a sense of a dedication, and three, just having something to be a release because music, while I, when I was younger, oh was a God. huge release for me because I, you know, there was a lot of stressful situations when I was growing up and having music be an outlet for me was huge because I don't think I would have had a, a more constructive way of doing it if it wasn't for that. It is true. And teachers are so important in the life of the kids. Uh, the boys and girls, they do need that mentorship so much. And, and it's heartbreaking what's going on right now. 
uh, especially with the short of funding for education. It really breaks hearts, especially for how is under um, appreciated the music programs, the art programs. It, it, it's really shocking. I still cannot. I'm from Panama, so for me, uh, that's in, that's the essence of education. Everything are connected and synchronized. So we have bands in our school, we have the music, and the music is so important in the kids' lives. So when I saw like they don't have so many of those options here, really, really is heartbreaking. So hopefully mm -hmm. very soon we see a change. And, yeah. and, and I'm so glad that you're interested to to represent this community, to teach them and to be part of them. Um, I did prepare something for today. Hopefully this works. You know, when you want to share something and. Yeah, it always works before and then when you want it, it to works work, it the, It works <laughs> the opposite way. Um, oh, where is my soul? I just want to see a little portion and I'm sharing my screen. I'm not, right? Of course I'm not. Okay. Let's do this one, y'all. There we go. In there, hanging there. Uh, your computer cell. So we're going to go a little bit over what you do. And I love this picture. You are like right there. <laughs> <laughs> I absolutely just sent us do, this. I'm like, oh my I God. He is inspired. He's over there. You can feel it. <laughs> um, so we're going to go a little bit first of your capoeira. I know it's an interesting relation uh, between percussion and capoeira, but what is this logos means to you? So the first one where it says Gordon Gioru, that's a capoeira group. It's a world-renowned capoeira group under the name, um, under the Mestre Mestre Suasuna. My mestre is named uh, Mestre Lobino. He's based in um, Ann Arbor, Michigan. And his mestre is Mestre Coruja. And he's based in Sao Paulo, Brazil. And those two have a direct uh, connection to Mestre Suasuna. Mestre Suasuna is kind of like the grandfather and the father of the two. Um, and Cordonji Oro is basically freedom of expression within the, basically within the style. So capoeira comes in different styles. Mm -hmm. There's capoeira angola, which is kind of the more traditional um, uh, point of capoeira. Then you have capoeira, capoeira regional, which is also traditional, but there was more focus on the martial aspect in the sense that um, not so much in the fighting and basically sparring component, more of the disciplinary uh, uh, side. So being very disciplined, very focused, they actually, um, the mestre most known for Capoeira Regional, or the actually creator of Capoeira Regional is called Mestre Bimba. And his goal was to have Capoeira deregulated and not be outlawed because during, in the early early um, 1900s, um, capoeira was outlawed in Brazil. It was illegal to practice capoeira. Oh, no. Even even though it was used as the main component to liberate um, the slaves in Brazil from the Portuguese conquistadors, it was capoeira was used in order to fight them off. It was still, uh, it was still viewed as a, a, a thuggish mar martial art, if, for lack of a better word. The, so they it was outlawed. And then Mestre Bimba, which he took uh, took it upon himself to get it um, legalized, and he succeeded. It became legalized. It was widely accepted, and it's flourished since then. He would he would be considered like the godfather of modern capoeira, and oh, wow. yeah. So and then there's the third style, which is called contemporánea, which means contemporary, and that's basically what I practice. And contemporánea really means it's like a bridge between capoeira angola and capoeira regional it's like somewhere in between it's not one or it's not necessarily defined mm -hmm. as one or the other it's somewhere somewhere in the middle and but our style in particular capoeira cordon Gioro, focuses more on freedom of expression freedom of body movement being not limited being able to basically play any game at any time and be be in the moment of of the game because that's what we call mm -hmm. it. We call it, we call it in Capoeira, they call it jogo. And a jogo means, literally means game. So when you are with another person in the circle or the hoda, which is, means circle or means 
uh, circle or, or tire, realistically, the wheel, the whole that, but it's mm. basically the circle. Um, you're playing a game with the person and the ob- the, the, basically the object of the game is to get the other person, not to hit the other person, not to basically, be, not to basically take out the other person, but to get the other person be like, I could have hit you, but I didn't. So I got you. <laughs> like a tease. And that's where the, yeah, it's basically, it's more like a tease. <laughs> We're just kind of teasing each other. You know, it's just like, it's going back and forth. And, and that's what the game is all about. Because, you know, one of, one of, uh, one of my favorite quotes in Capoeira is, if you're playing somebody and mm-hmm. you hurt them, then you can't play the game anymore. So oh. the best way is just to play and not hurt because once you hurt the person, that's it, the game's over. And oh, wow. now a lot of self control there. So, <laughs> yeah. So it, it's more like, and I've you been in situations where, it, <laughs> yeah, I've been in situations where it can get pretty heated and people do, you know, let their yeah. egos get in the way. But that, that's the golden rule in Capoeira or the golden lesson in Capoeira is learning how to control your ego. And That's because ego awesome. in any situation can really take over your, you know, over your goals. So, and then Capoeira Corn del Yoru, we just celebrated 50 years of Capoeira, El Messi Suasuna, and Capoeira Corn del Yoru really harbors those fat, uh, those, all, all of those aspects. Some of the martial, most of the play, really being expressive, really being open, and really being able to show the beauty in Capoeira. Wow, amazing. I'm going to go with the next slide. Then this one is going to be fun. You're also <laughs> a DJ. <laughs> yes. So where do you play uh, before so, COVID? So like how all this came up? Um, this is kind of like all connected, but I, I want to hear because this is interesting. <laughs> so um DJing is a little bit harder to explain. So I had a friend, his name is Todd Gillenwater, and he was co-hosting an event with somebody else and they ran into a snafu that they didn't have a DJ. And at this point, I didn't DJ. I didn't know kind of anything about, well, not, that's not true. I didn't know anything, Not did not know anything about DJing. My father is a DJ and he's he mm-hmm. was originally so we're all originally from tampa florida that's where we kind of our home base was for a really long time then we moved up to rochester when i was around nine or ten we went back for a little little while but then we came back to rochester we've been here ever since um but my dad was a, a very big time dj in tampa florida he was kind of like the MC for the puerto rican festival in tampa um he was one of the most contracted djs he, he had huge connections with a lot of the salseros from um uh, from puerto rico people like tito roja tito nieve el gran combo he was really real, well connected with them and he and that's kind of like i i didn't ever you think grew i grew up with that in. yeah well well the thing well i grew up with it but i was like ah, i don't think i'm gonna do that <laughs> go figure <laughs> so um, well, back to the story I was saying about my friend Todd Gillenwater with his event, and he came up to me. He's like, hey, we need a DJ. You think you can do it? And me, I was like, I don't really, I didn't, this was me thinking in my head. It's like, well, I've never DJed, but it looks easy enough. So I was like, sure, I'll do it. And then without really any experience, I kind of just did it. And I downloaded a program. I was like, I spent a, a week <laughs> or so trying to figure it out. And then I was like, all right, let's do this. And at first since that, I just kept on doing it. I was like, this is actually pretty fun. So I just kept on doing it. And that you was about go. seven years ago. Oh my goodness. So, yeah. So I kind One of stuck the, with so it. many hats that you wear. It's unbelievable. Mm-hmm. And then Sonidos Unidos, experience culture. And I love that mo- like the, the missions that you have, experience culture. Uh-huh. Um, so you are the director and founder. Yes. When this one started, so um back in 2014 um uh well let me let me do the longer part version of the story so i have two sisters my older sister bianca and talia and they're both singers and they would bother me after i graduated from college and really became a more for, uh basically more experienced more educated within the art of music um I was doing a lot of things, but then I eventually moved back to Rochester. I was in Miami for three years studying at University of Miami. Then I moved to New York for an internship because my degree from University of Miami is music uh, music business and marketing, 
So I really, I studied more on the business side, but I never stopped performing. So realistically, well, my, my, I have a minor in performance from the uh, uh, University of Miami as well, but I was still, you know, considered uh, part of the performance program because I was part of all the ensembles. I was in wind ensemble. I was in brass ensemble. I was in percussion ensemble. I did all these ensembles. So I was on the same track as most performance majors, but I, I emphasized more on the business side. Um, so when I came back to home to Rochester, both of my sisters are like, we should start a band. And I was like, ah, you guys are crazy. I'm not going to start a band with you guys. No, we'll, we'll only fight if we start a band. But after a while, you know, I tr tried to get into the music scene in Rochester and it didn't, it wasn't leading to anywhere. It, nobody was really giving me an opportunity to play. And, you know, I don't consider myself one of the best musicians in the world, but, you know, I can hold my own with a lot of other yes, you can. But it seemed like... A, well, there was, there was, the, the doors were very close. This, I've learned a lot about Rochester. Rochester is a very, I'll use for lack of a better term, tight knit community. And they tend to roll with the same crowds no matter what. And I learned that lesson the hard way after a few years of being here, of being back after, you know, being out of, out of the city for such a long time. Um, I found myself at a basically a musical plateau. It was like, okay, I'm not playing with anybody. I'm just kind of letting these the skills that I've acquired over the years go to waste. So I decided to start my own group and specifically in the salsa, bachata, merengue genres. Yeah. And so we d started the group. We had our first gig at Loving Cup in that same year in 2014. And then since then, we just kind of kept on growing, expanding, to, um, really devoting ourselves to creating a, a, a brand. Our brand is Sonidos Unidos. Mm -hmm. and, and it comes to the two things. The ex experience our, and, and experience our culture because you don't, we don't specifically aim for like the Latino community, we try to be all inclusive. We want people that don't know this music. That's the whole really idea. Experience, yes. experience it and see what the, the, the Latino culture is like, because we're probably one of the few Latin, Latin groups in Rochester that plays some English music just because we know how it feels. Nice. It's like, we understand you, you go, like we think about it on the other spectrum. It's like you go to a bar and then, or you go to a club or you go to a venue mm -hmm. and they're playing music. That you don't know. It's like, okay, this is kind of boring. I don't really know any, <laughs> but if you kind of draw your crowd into what you do, so say, oh, I've heard that song. I've never heard it yes. this way, but it sounds really cool. Now you have them engaged. And now they're more open to listening to what you have to offer compared mm -hmm. to just kind of shoving it in their face. No, that's And that's true. kind and of the goal. Of, no, I love kind of, it, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And that's kind of the goal of Sonidos Unidos is really to diversify and include because without the inclusion, the diversity doesn't matter. That's awesome. And I talk a little bit about inclusion, right? I have uh, mixed race kids. Um, mm -hmm. My kids doesn't speak any Spanish. So when, when we're in the car, sometimes they play music in English. Oh, they get so excited because they are part of the culture, but they don't feel that part of the culture because the yeah. language barrier. And it's not the same, but it's so amazing when you're also trying to keep that portion and how how a better way to keep our future generation engaged if you don't talk to them if you don't connect with them if you don't include them exactly. and, and eventually whatever you don't share is not going to pass to the next generation so this is awesome oh my god Julio, thank you for sharing this story sonidos sonidos i really can't wait until everything opens and hear the band play i'm pretty sure it's going to put everybody's feet to dance yeah no, no, um, well, we can't wait we can't wait to get back <laughs> yes and i'm mentioning about going back um you were i mean everybody that is in this inter industry has been severely impacted we everything that has been in COVID. I mean, we lost our major revenues. Um, we cannot mm -hmm. teach, we, don't, we cannot play, we don't have concert, we don't have performance time, so we don't get any incomes. And it's been so hard uh, for all of us. But you found a very creative, I just put a little, um, this is back in July when everything was going on. And mm -hmm. when you start moving your performances to online platform. Mm -hmm. um, what else have you been done differently? Um, 
with the with the new new year how can we even call this um how how everything has changed for you well you know um with the teach and the dj your music um some of the teaching has been occurring through zoom which has been a challenge but an interesting challenge it's been like okay well i've heard about this a few times and it it seemed like an option before and but i never really ventured into it until you're kind of like it's the human the human condition you're not you're not going to change until your force has changed and that's kind of what i i guess that's the biggest lesson i've learned in 2020 is kind of like <laughs> You know, anything can happen. So you have to be able to adapt and change with the, with the changes as they come. Mm -hmm. And that's really what I've been trying to do is like for a while I was doing the online um, hosting of just playing music. So people, you know, don't really kind of lose that connection. I haven't been doing it as much just because um, Rochester has been one of the lower um, case areas and people have been going out a lot more. So I've kind of, I've kind of helped, but at the beginning I was doing it pretty much every Friday. I, I would know. go on, play music, you know, give shout outs to people and say, Hey, you know, we're still looking forward to coming back. We're just kind of, kind of do this, this virtual environment for now. And, you know, people were receptive for a while. It was really, really good. But like I said, just because of the summer and everybody starting to do yes. things outdoors, kind of changed the dynamic a little bit but who knows maybe back in the fall if things aren't you know who, who knows what's, what's going to happen if things are going to stay the same oh so hopefully not. Probably, hopefully probably we go open and we go back to normal <laughs> yeah yeah well we'll, we'll, we'll see no, there's no really big announcements at this point but as things get colder and people might venture in again and stay in more often so it might be something that I'll revisit, but you know, I was doing it for a while and it was going well. People were really enjoying the music, enjoying the vibe. So it was, it was, it was fun just kind of to venture into the virtual platform a little bit. <laughs> it was, um, I mean, in the middle of the storm, in the middle where we are all scared, confused, anxious, stressed, imagine all life, everybody's life changed overnight. Yes. And then you go on, on the middle of a Friday and you have somebody just playing music, they have their list of all going. That was so nice. I, I mean, I never say that to you, but it was so nice to see that. Like, oh my God, somebody at least is bringing something positive. Yeah. Just the moment that you open social media, it's all stress. It was, oh my God, what I'm going to yeah. do? I mean, it was so much. And then you see this, it was so uplifting. It was really nice, really yeah. nice. Uh, our time is up. I went a little over. I appreciate so much. I have one more thing to share. <laughs> when we started classes, my son was like, how oh, this going to even work? Good. My eyes can see. My eyes can see what you're playing. And I can hear it in my head. I'm going to do it again. I play the big drum. I play the big drum. I play the big, really big, really big drum. Go! My son was like, can he really hear us? Beautiful. Whoever has a setting for app, oh, these are going to be these are the thing go and then you go. It's you hear it, then you go, you go. It just it just sounds like one of the things. So funny. So call and response. Call and response. <laughs> So I want That's to share that because <laughs> <laughs> my son was like, can he really hear? Because you said, yeah, I can hear you in my head. He's like, wow. I said, teachers have superpowers. Like, what do you think? What well, you think? you know, <laughs> once you do something for so long, you know exactly what the person is doing. It's just like you could see, it's like, it's not so much, you don't necessarily have to hear, hear it. It's like, if you can visualize it and it's like, it's like yes. seeing the hand movement kind of shows me what you're playing. <laughs> and that's actually a way I learn. I learn that was actually the first way I started learning percussion was watching. So not so much hearing, but watching the, watching the hands because if I'm able to mimic what you're doing, the sound's going to be automatic. So the sound mm -hmm. it wasn't the important part. It was the actual visualization of seeing what the hand was doing, how it was doing it, and really focusing on the visual so I can interpret, well, not inter like kind of 
take that take away take that technique and apply it to myself and then yeah. once i have the technique the sound all you have to do is replicate the sound and the sound that's actually the easy part is hearing <laughs> something to play but the, the technique is always the hard that's awesome i mean i i can't wait to show everybody what it looks what everything looks now i mean that was a very first class you see the kids all over the place at the beginning and mm -hmm. i mean you're teaching kids that have a special need so it's not that they are can be sit down and be in a computer they are all over the place and now the difference so i can wait yeah. until we can show uh we have more videos but i'm not sure they're saving those yeah. for something special but the difference has been <laughs> enormous so Thank you, Julio, for sharing a little bit of your story. Um, everybody remember in the comments, you can find Julio's information. I definitely recommend it if you want to learn percussion, uh, if you want to start getting involved in more cultural activities, especially now that the kids are going to be many of them at home. This is a great time for you guys to connect with Julio. I seen it in my son. I mean, he's not paying me to say this. Uh, if I didn't like him, I won't say it. <laughs> but it does make a huge difference. The kids love him, and he's a really great instructor. And are you going to be still teaching in Eastman, or how that's going to work? I forgot to Yes, ask. the Eastman Community School, that is still going. There are limitations on classes. So if, mm -hmm. if for some reason there was an influx of people that were interested, I would I would have to start a op I would have to open a second section. So okay. right now I think the limitation is ten, and I, I'm pretty much at that. I think maybe I'm short, maybe one or two slots. So if I get it's six right new hurry. people, maybe two, <laughs> I would. I, I, well, I would I would suggest letting me know as soon as possible. That way I can approach the school and open a new session for the students. Yes, and that way That's we would have. That's awesome. Well, Julio, thank you so much for sharing a little bit of your history. Uh, in our YouTube channel, we will have the Spanish subtitles translation for this, for those that doesn't speak English or have a very hard time following the English conversation, like me, <laughs> myself. So we will have also the uh, subtitles for for your, um, to keep you updated. So Julio, thank you. Uh, thank you, everybody. I hope you enjoy the rest of your day, whatever day of the week this is for you. Uh, for us, it's Friday, so we're gonna go <laughs> and we're gonna go party. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Bye, everybody. Bye, Julio. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Take care. Mm -hmm.